to, to, to not uh, encourage people to keep coming later and later. Uh, we have two talks this morning. It's a pleasure to introduce Adnan Darwish, who's our first speaker. Uh, he's a, Adnan's well known to the SAT, SAT community for having uh, worked on showing that CDCL can simulate re resolution, but he's uh, also worked extensively in, uh, in, in AI topics, included, I mean, including, including machine learning and Bayesian networks, among other things. And he's speaking today on branching on formulas, a perspective from knowledge compilation. So, Adnan, thank you. All right, thank you, Sam. So, all right. So, yes, branching on formulas as opposed to uh, branching on variables. I think this is a very interesting uh, uh, distinction that comes up uh, uh, quite practically, as you will see, but it's a subject that I don't think has uh, received uh, perhaps a systematic treatment as much as it should be. Uh, it's one thing that I mentioned in my class, graduate class on the subject quite a bit as something where more work needs to be done. So let's uh, see what's going on here. So um, branching on variables, uh, or branching here, I mean case analysis. Uh, this is a uh, a profoundly entrenched technique in uh, automated uh, reasoning, right? So we try to solve a problem and uh, we try to uh, solve uh, simpler problems in order to solve the original uh, more complex problem. And we do this by uh, looking at cases. So uh, with uh, branching on variables, I basically go and say try X is true, try X is false. And uh, you can see this is like a basis for set solvers in resolution. Uh, if X is false, then alpha. If X is true, then beta. And therefore, I conclude alpha or beta. I'm doing case analysis on variables. Uh, uh, the influential uh, bull shannon expansion is based on this notion as well. Uh, I can rewrite a formula by conditioning it uh, on X being true, X being false. I conjoin this with a positive literal X with a negative literal, and then I can rewrite it like this. And as so many applications, of course, this is the basis of DPLL, but has even more direct and powerful uses as we will see uh, later. Now, the point is, uh, there is a more general of branching or case analysis, and that is uh, case analysis on formulas. And what does that mean? So in the simplest form, I'm gonna go and, and solve my problem by saying, assume alpha, then assume not alpha, or alpha is an arbitrary sentence. And um, you can even do this more generally by uh, branching on a set of sentences. So in this case, I have a set of sentences alpha one through alpha n, and I'm gonna say, assume alpha one, and then assume alpha two, dot, 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 uh, where these alphas are exhaustive. So I'm covering the cases, but not simply by looking at a literal and its negation. Now, this generalizes this, not just in the sense of having uh, multiple formulas instead of two, uh, there's something very important here. This, uh, these two cases are mutually exclusive. Uh, here, this does not require that. So the cases that I'm looking at may overlap and uh, they could be mutually exclusive, but they don't have to be. And that's actually a subtle but important distinction. So they could or could not be mutually exclusive. This is more general. And actually, these do not have to be exhaustive. Uh, they just have to cover the cases that you know are possible. So instead of just requiring, okay, this is instead of this, implying uh, it being equal to true and there's a typo or whether they're just implied by my input formula. So um, subtle distinctions when you go and do a branching on formula. So the bottom line is this, bottom line is if you're branching on variables, bottom line is you may be doing exponentially more work than necessary. And uh, the way we're gonna approach this uh, is from the viewpoint of knowledge compilation, we'll say what that is later. And, and the bottom line ends up being a little bit sharper in the sense that not only are you doing exponentially more work, but we can tell you more specifically, you are actually solving a harder problem than you really need to, than the problem you're really trying to, to solve if you branch on variables. And wh why is, what's the interaction with knowledge compilation and why we're bringing this into uh, this uh, distinction and this subject for two reasons. One of them is in knowledge compilation, we have to build knowledge compilers, uh, a little bit more powerful things than set solvers. They target problems beyond NP. And this notion comes up a lot. And this is how I got into this because and you'll see this practically uh, later. Uh, you will need to think about this and you will realize that you're limited if you branch on variables. Now, the other interesting thing is, and is what you'll see is 
The knowledge compilation provides very interesting and sharp theoretical tools to talk about this distinction and the implications. So it, it's, it, there's a practical interest in addressing this problem or studying it, but it also happens that the problem that needs it has the tools to, to talk about it. And that's what we're gonna see today. So before I move on, let me just say one thing. So we know this in a sense from a long time ago that branching on formulas versus variables is powerful. Uh, and the story comes from extended resolution. We know that we have uh, some problems that have exponential size resolution proofs, but poly size extended resolution proofs. And uh, if you see what happens in, in extended resolution, we add these rules, we, we introduce these auxiliary variables that we equate to, in this case, to a simple type of formula. And this can be thought of as these clauses, but really what's going on here is, if I go and say, assume X, then I'm effectively uh, assuming this formula and assume not X, I'm actually looking at its negation. So what's happening is something very interesting, which is I'm using uh, branching on variables to emulate the branching on formulas. Now I'm gonna be telling you two, two concrete stories about branching on formulas in the rest of the talk. And the second one will actually allude to this technique. Uh, there is a lot more that can be said about it uh, because this is a little bit too specific here, but just to point this out. So this, this notion of auxiliary variables and using them to emulate branching or formulas has been established for a while and it's pretty important we're gonna get to it. So I, I said, I'm gonna tell you two stories about branching on formulas. Uh, and uh, I just need a little bit of background on knowledge compilation before we uh, move on. So let, let me go ahead and do that uh, now and, and invoke a couple of tools that we need for this purpose. What is knowledge compilation? Now, the classical definition is it's some kind of processing technique. You give me an input formula, I wanna do something, I go and compile it into something else and I facilitate what I wanna do later by amortizing my efforts that I did in the offline compilation phase during the online phase. Okay, this is outdated in a sense. It, knowledge compilation has been around for about 40 years perhaps in AI. And the last 20 years look very different from the ones before. And as you'll see what happened with knowledge compilation, it, it's not an aid, it is it in a sense. It's, it's it ended up being a methodology for computation. What do I mean by that? We take an input formula and compile it into something. And we insist that that something is tractable for the task that we want, which means the time you finish compilation, you're done. There is no more anything to be aided afterwards. It's the end story if I succeed in compiling. And what happened over the last years, it's been an explosion of study of what I compile into, which tend to be circuits and tractable circuits in particular, and negation normal form circuits even more specifically. There's a whole family of these circuit types that we try to compile into. And we have a wealth of knowledge that has been built by the community about these circuit types, their powers, their relative succinctness, and so on. And we're gonna invoke these tools next. So, uh, negation normal form circuits, which is the subject of what most of what's been happening in the last many years is, Pretty simple. Uh, these are circuits with three types of gates, inverters, ands, and ors. You have one restriction. The inverters can only appear next to inputs. So what I have is a circuit where either the inputs are either variables or they're negations. And then I have layers of ands and ors, no restrictions on ands and ors, fan ins, fan outs, and so on. Okay, this is by itself is not very interesting. In fact, and it's also not restrictive. So if your ors are not, at the input, you can always push them to the input uh, while at most doubling the size of the circuit. Okay. Things get interesting when you start adding properties to these circuits and then they become tractable. That is, they start doing things that are hard in general. So there is so many of these and so many properties and therefore circuit types. I'm not gonna talk about this. I talked two hours about this a month ago at uh, the Beyond SAT workshop. Here, I'm going to just mention two properties. They're going to be simple. The composability, which is a property you impose, and you get a type of circuits called DNNR circuits, gives you SAT. So satisfiability becomes easy. And another property called determinism. If you add on top of the composability, you get a new circuit type called DDNNF, and then sharp SAT becomes easy. You can do sharp set easy with that. So that circuit type is very, very important in model counting, probabilistic reasoning, and so on. So we're going to talk about these next. 
and uh, some separation results that will be the basis of uh, further talking about um, uh, branching on formulas versus variables. The composite is very simple. Uh, it applies to AND gates. It's a property about AND gates. It says if you have an AND gate and you look at the subcircuits that feed into it, they, those circuits cannot, subcircuits cannot share variables. Uh, so in this case, I'm highlighting two subcircuits. And one of them mentions the variable LK, the other is PA. They do not overlap. And by the way, this looks like a tree, uh, but it's actually the circuit. Like you have L here and L there, but we're just laying it out this way for visual convenience. You want every AND gate to satisfy this property. Any subsequent feeding into it cannot <clears throat> share variables. And then it's called the composable DNNF. And sad is easy on this guy, believe it or not, linear time. In fact, you can do something else in linear time, which subsumes set. And I'm going to mention it on the next slide because we're going to need it later. So existential quantification. So you can existentially quantify any number of variables in linear time from these circuits while maintaining the composability. So the input is a DNNF, the output is a DNNF. And the process is super simple. Uh, here's a DNNF. I want to existentially quantify the variables X and Z. And the process simply says, look for every occurrence of these variables, whether negative or positive, and replace it by two. And that's it. The result is a tractable circuit in DNNF form. And uh, it is. Uh, Basically, you can see how this allows you to do that because you can existentially quantify every variable and easily test whether the resulting circuit is constant, true or, or false. Uh, what uh, a couple of weeks ago, so Pratik talked about uh, the importance of existential quantification in functional synthesis. Uh, his group is actually, and colleagues is even introducing new circuit types that they particularly target existential quantification. Okay, let's talk about the second property to finish this uh, uh, part on background. Determinism. Determinism is another influential property, and uh, it's a property of uh, OR gates, OR gates. And if I put this property on top of decomposability, then I can do sharp set. I can count models, satisfying assignments easily. And the property is pretty simple. If you look at the inputs of any OR gate in your circuit, let's look at the top one and call the inputs alpha one, alpha two, alpha three. I just want these to be mutually exclusive, all right? That's it. And I want this for every OR gate. So if I have this with decomposability, you can do counting in polytime. If you have another property called smoothness, which I'm going to skip, it's easy to enforce. It's a convenience property. You can actually do it in linear time. And, and let me show you. It's super simple. I want to count the models of this guy. This is both decomposable and deterministic. Uh, you basically feed ones and zeros in the input. Uh, every literal length negation get one, constants get one or zero. And you just add that or gates multiply and, and gates and da, da, da. And that tells you already this circuit has nine satisfying assignments out of 16. It has actually four variables. This has been pretty influential circuit type because you can do weight, model counting, you can do weighted model counting, you pass weights instead of numbers and reductions for probabilistic reasoning to Boolean formulas then to this are commonplace uh, today based on that. Okay, now I cheated. I told you I'm gonna only do two circuit types. Uh, I'm going to do one more uh, and we finish this background. But let me just say a word which is also going to be significant in the second story about existential quantification. While existentially quantifying variables from DNNF is easy, it is not on deterministic DNNF, simply because there's no polynomial algorithm for this. Uh, because a formula may have a compact deterministic decomposable representation, but if you existentially quantify variables from it, the result may explode. Now, this formula that I showed you before, and I told you it was DNNF and I existentially quantified, it actually also did, happens to be deterministic. So this is actually a deterministic DNNF. So what happens if I apply the procedure that I told you about? Well, since this is a DNNF, the procedure works. So this is indeed the existential quantification of that. But the, the, the difference is while this is both deterministic and decomposable, I cannot guarantee you that the output is deterministic and decomposable. I can only guarantee you that it's decomposable. And this is gonna be essential in one of the main insights later about branching on variables versus branching on uh, variables. We're gonna invoke this notion that I can easily quanti existentially quantify on DNF, but if I existentially quantify a deterministic circuits, 
I'm only guaranteed to get decomposable, but I, I would lose determinism in general. Okay, so in this case, this was deterministic, the top or node, but it's no longer deterministic in the uh, result. Okay, guys, as I said, I cheated. I, I needed one more circuit type, uh, which is very significant from a practical point of view. This is a subset of the last circuit type which is deterministic DNF. It's called decision DNF. And the idea here, I want determinism, but in a very specific way. I want every OR gate to look like this. Two inputs only. One input is an AND gate, the other is an AND gate. And here you have a variable alpha, not variable alpha. So this guy represents this formula. You can see it's deterministic. It's mutually exclusive, but the conflict is very specific. It's a conflict on a specific variable. And this ends up being a subset of the previous guy. You see why this is significant in practice. Uh, and it's tied to this notion of splitting on variables versus splitting on formulas. It is in fact, one of the implications of uh, splitting on variables, which is so commonplace. And that is actually pinning us in a hole in a sense, as you will see later. Okay, quickly here to wrap up this part. These three circuit types are exponentially separated. So if you go from the composable uh, negation of a form, you add determinism, you get an exponential separation. Uh, this was shown unconditionally recently. There was a condition result from a while back. If you have not determinism, but decision determinism, instead of the general type of determinism, you also get an exponential separation. Uh, this was actually shown a few years uh, back in, in conference papers by Beam and his folks, but this is the more general uh, version. And these separations are gonna be critical for what we're gonna see later. But the basic story is, if you try to uh, uh, use branching on variables in a very broad context, you are committing yourself to these guys and you are really missing out big time. And if you wanna go up the hierarchy of these things, you have to branch on formulas. That's the gist of the story. And I'll show you how later. And the interesting thing that's gonna come up from this story is I can characterize what you're doing in terms of what you committed yourself to and what kind of problems you're really solving, not the one you think you are solving, but the one you are indeed solving if you branch on variables. We can characterize that by talking about which circuit types are you actually compiling. We're gonna make this very sharp as you'll see. Two other circuit types. So, so there are gonna be two stories next. Uh, the, the second story would refer to these and their separations and the existential quantification that I've mentioned. The first story, we refer to two other circuit types, which will come up on the way as we go on. OBDDs, I guess a lot of people know that. There is a generalization called SDDs. They're also exponentially separated. And these two guys are not comparable. So uh, there are functions that can be easily presented by this, will blow up by that and the other way around. Uh, and these two papers show Beam and Liu showed that this can blow up while this can be compact. This more recent result show the other way around. And I wish to thank Pierre Marquis and Alexis de Cornet for helping out with uh, figuring out all of the details of these separation results. Okay, folks, let's go to the first story. Uh, but if you want to hear more about knowledge compilation and this you know, very rich uh, picture, uh, this is the original paper that laid out this uh, picture that I'm mentioning here. There is a more recent tutorial uh, five year, actually, there was a five week, five day workshop in France, and there was a tutorial on knowledge compilation it's available online. You can see my two hour uh, that I gave a month ago. But let's go over the first story on branching on formulas. All right. So, uh, in, in this story, the, the bottom line is we're going to generalize uh, branching on variables to formulas in a specific way, and we're going to get a, a very concrete exponential self separation practically. Uh, that's basically what's going to happen here. And what we're going to do is we're going to generalize the Shannon expansion. So the Shannon expansion is, uh, is a case analysis of variables. And I want to go and do something like this. Uh, instead of saying X or not X, I'm going to go and uh, do a case analysis on formulas. And you're going to see the, the, the implications of this. And um, now we're going to say, wait a minute, what does this mean? What are these alphas? Where do I get them from? What does it even mean to condition a form? A, a, function, a Boolean function on a formula, I know how to condition it on a variable setting, we're gonna see this. The, the, the crux of what I'm gonna tell you is the following. This expansion is unique once you give me the variable. So if you come and tell me X, expand on X, here it is, no choices. This that I'm gonna show you next is also unique, but instead of a variable, I want a set of variables from you. 
And once you give me a set of variables, I'm gonna show you how to do it this way, where these formulas are gonna be over those variables. So I'm gonna be branching on formulas that refer to some variables and you give me those variables. Here's how it works. Here's the formula, I wanna expand it as I just mentioned. So as I said, I need variables from you uh, to do these alphas on, and you go and put, choose A and B. What I'm gonna show you now is not how it works in practice because uh, this is not practical, but this is to conceptually explain how we're gonna branch on formulas. You give me your variables and here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna look at every instantiation of these variables and there's four of them. And I'm gonna condition the, the, the function or the Boolean formula on these guys. That's well-defined. These are variable instantiations. I'm gonna get this. And then I'm gonna do one more thing. Anytime these conditionings match, I'm gonna combine them. So this case and that case get combined. How? By disjoining these two guys. So I'm gonna get this now. Now I'm gonna keep repeating this until there is no more joining uh, or collapsing of cases that can happen. And then I'm done. And there's only one way of doing this, this process. This guy is unique. Once you tell me what are the variables that you wanna do case analysis on. And so what I did in this case, once you told me what A and B is, uh, these are the two cases that I combined here. Uh, I rewrote my function like this and using our notation, that's what I did. So these are my cases, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, they're mutually exclusive and exhaustive. And we call these primes. Uh, we call these guys subs. So I have prime multiplied by sub. And this is something that I call the compressed XY partition about a decade ago when I introduced it. Now, what is Y? Uh, why is every other variable? So you fix X and this is AB, Y here it would be CD. And one thing you have to observe is while the alphas are by construction are, are over X, the, uh, these are the primes, the subs are over the Y variables. So X, Y, X, Y, and the order matters here. If you flip that, it's a different story. You get a different expansion. Now we're gonna tell you the implications of this. and how big of a deal this turned out to be uh, branching on formulas. But let me just mention one more thing. I talked about this briefly a month ago at the Beyond Set workshop and Karim Skala brought up orthonormal expansions. Uh, frankly, I just told him, I remember we had this discussion. I didn't even remember what they were. And later he was kind enough to show, send me a, a screenshot from a book, uh, an old book in which uh, uh, this is defined. Orthonormal expansions, you have a function, uh, you rewrite it like this, and these guys are mutually exclusive and exhaustive, all right? So what's the relation to what I just showed? What I just showed is a very specific instance of this. This puts no conditions on these guys. Remember, what we have, if you want to call these primes and these subs, I require these to be over a set of variables X and these to be over a disjoint set of variables Y. I require these guys be distinct. So yes, it is uh, the complex XY partition is an instance of an orthonormal expansion. And so is the bull Shannon expansion is an instance of compressed XY partition and therefore uh, an instance of orthonormal expansions. But both of these guys get their properties because of the additional uh, properties they impose. And I don't know if you've noticed, but if you choose your X to be a single variable, then this uh, reduces to the uh, shannon bull expansion. Okay, now we get to the punchline and move to the next story. Uh, what's the punchline? What do I do with this? How does this help me? What, what is the exponential separation? How do I use it for? Well, what do we use the shannon bull expansion for? One of the major uses in the construction of OBDs. Uh, you know about OBDs, some people tell you this is perhaps, the most studied tractable representation of Boolean circuits. They're decision graphs like this that represent the Boolean formulas and they have an ordering of the variables. So the variables X, Y, Z, uh, okay, that's the classical definition, but they're just circuits, they're negation normal form circuits. If you expand this decision node notation, uh, X go this way, X not X go that way, you rewrite it like X and da, not X and da. If you wanna see our circuit notation, that's what's going on. All of these three different notations are the same thing. So these are negation normal form circuits. And how do I obtain them for a Boolean formula? I obtain them by a repeated application of the wood shannon expansion, how? Remember, first I need a variable ordering because to apply that expansion, I need to know what variables to apply it on. So in this case, the, the order is X, Y, Z. So what do I do? You give me the, the Boolean function F and you said X, Y, Z. Okay, let's expand on X. Okay, I got my first portion of the OBDD. Uh, X 
and this or not X and that. And then what do I do? I take each one of these guys and again, expand it using the bool channel expansion. And I need a variable. You gave me an ordering, so it's going to be Y. I take this guy, expand on Y. And then now I got my second part here. So I'm conditioning this on not Y and Y dot, dot, dot. And you repeat this in your time. Pretty simple. Canonical. One of the biggest thing about OBDs is it's unique. If you give me the variable order, there is no other way of doing this. There's only one way of doing this. So I get you a canonical representation. So now that we can branch on formulas using also a canonical expansion, the question is what happens if I don't do this, but I use the XY partition to compress XY partition? What happens? Well, you get another type of circuits and, and but you're going to say to me, but wait a minute, no, no, just a second. Here I know how to apply it because I, I need a variable order. And that tells me exactly what to do at every step of the recursive decomposition. What are you going to do for the other guy? Every time you need a set of variables, how are you going to specify that so that you can guide me into applying this uniquely? Right? Uh, here's the function. If you choose your x and therefore y is determined, you expand it like this into primes and subs. Now I'm going to have to expand each one of these guys. How are you going to tell me the choices of these guys? There is a simple notion called a v-tree, variable tree, full binary tree where the leaves are my variables. And this fully specifies what you need to do case analysis on every step of the recursion. So the root node tells you what to do for the very first function. It's telling you the left variables are x, the right variables are y. Okay, so you know what to do first step here. Now, if you're gonna go expand these, this tells you, let's pick the primes. Then you go to this node, and this V3 tells you how to do it. So now this is X and this is Y. So this V3 tells you at every step what variables to do case analysis on and therefore branch on sentences on. And that uniquely determines the output. And the output is known as an STD, sentential decision diagram. I introduced these uh, about a decade ago. There's strict generalization of OBDDs and they are exponentially separated as shown by Voba three years uh, back. So this is one story about uh, branching on sentences as opposed to variables and the exponential impact that it has. Uh, there is an open source SDD package. If you wanna see a picture of an SDD, what we've been looking at is an SDD actually. Uh, this is uh, the first expansion here, the first XY decomposition prime subs pretty powerful circuit types. If you have a formula and you compile it into one of these guys with an appropriate V3, you can do mash mash set PP to the PP complete in linear time on these guys, all right? Uh, I have an online course, which has a couple of hours or three hours on these circuits. If you need uh, to know more about them, you can find this from my uh, YouTube channel. Uh, just uh, type UCLA automated design group, you will find that and let me see how much time um, <clears throat> so I have about 10, 10, 15 more minutes, Sam, for the oh. second story. Excellent. That's yes, okay, okay. Good. very good. So now I'm telling the second story. The second story is more intriguing because more open-ended. So the first one looks like seven. Yes, it is a, a, a success story, nice, closed in a sense. And this one is a little bit more intricate uh, because it's kind of open-ended and gets more to the mainstream way of doing things today. And the short story is, I'll tell you, I'm going to invoke another tool from knowledge compilation or another major development. So let me just briefly tell you what it is. The short story is this. Algorithms that uh, do search based on variable splitting and variable branching, you can talk about these algorithms uh, as, as leaving traces. You can sit and watch them do their work. And as they go to different places, you mark things on the side. And you can show that they are actually writing out circuits. Their traces are circuit types, as in I showed you uh, earlier. So they are implicit knowledge compilers. They're doing enough work to compile their input formula. And we're gonna formalize this and it's very easy to formalize. And the idea is once I establish the trace of your algorithm, I can tell you about it. I can tell you where it will fail because I know that for those input formulas, if you're in trace X, I know that they cannot represent things using X compactly and I tell you where you will succeed. So 
we will use this tool, we will establish this notion of a trace and then use it to tell you about how severe is this notion of branching on variables in current context is and what it takes to do to break away from this and, and really do things way more efficiently. The notion of a trace is pretty simple. You look at something like, and, and we did this with uh, Jumbo Huang, you look at a formula like this and if you run exhaustive PPLL on it, we know what that is, right? You're, you're searching in a tree by fixing the values of variables. If, if you were doing SAT, then you're done in this case. DPLL keeps going. And initially people propose this to count models, right? So you keep going and you try the other branch of X and da, 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 and then now you terminate. So you've basically exhausted DPLL or, or exhausted DPLL. Now, I'll show you how this is a rewrite of your input formula as, as, as a circuit compilation. and we know this by now, how to translate something like this into something like that. This decision node X false go this way, X true go that way. That's this fragment here, right? So this simple uh, rewrite or trace is this. Now, this is not interesting because this is a tree, but actually this is equivalent to your input formula. So it is a rewrite. Now, what happened is people over the years did a whole bunch of advances to these search algorithms. Uh, and I'm gonna show you three of them quickly. And you will see that each advance leads to a new circuit type. If you keep a trace like I showed you, you get a different circuit type. So you, could, you get to see the power of these techniques by looking at what they did to the traces. You add one technique, you get a new type of traces. And I know that they're exponentially separated from the previous ones. I can analyze what you did algorithmically using tools from knowledge compilation and what I know about successiveness of these things. I'm not gonna go over all of these details. That story is, is a little bit uh, refined, but I'm just gonna point to one particular trace at the end of this, which is our concern here, which will point us to the limitations of branching on variables, which is intrinsic to these kind of algorithms. First technique is I want to avoid redundant traces. So if you look at the, the trace that I just showed you, you can see two portions are exactly the same. I, I want to avoid that. <clears throat> and that's easy. Technique from uh, OBDD literature known as unique node. You have a hash table. You make sure that you do not construct a node if you have something similar to it. And you can easily check that if you do it in a certain fashion. In this case, you start by making sure that unique nodes are, are unique. And then when you do that, nodes like this become easily detectable that they are duplicates. So you don't do this, you do that instead. <clears throat> and then uh, you get this. Now, this doesn't help with time, but it helps with space. It's essential, unique node. And uh, I don't know if you realize, but this is already an OBDD now um, uh, compilation. Now, the second technique uh, that people did is, uh, which help with time, is uh, known as formula uh, caching. So the idea is if you look at the search space and here's two paths in the search, space, different variable instantiations uh, of this formula, but the residual formula is equivalent. So I try to avoid compiling this again, given that I already did this and you do this by caching the formulas and the results on them and then looking them up. And the third uh, technique, is component analysis. And uh, what happens here is once, as you fix the values of the, your variables, your input formula start disconnecting and you, you get independent components. And the idea is you wanna spawn independent PPLL searches on these independent components. <clears throat> and you add all of these guys, you end up finding that your trace is a decision DNF. Now I skipped intermediate traces. You, you add this technique, the trace becomes this. You add this technique, I'm skipping this. We're just gonna focus on this for the interest of time. And let me just show you this visually. So here's a, an input formula. I, I start doing a case analysis. Um, okay, I, I froze for a second here. I have this uh, input formula. I, I do in case analysis on variable A. I set A, I simplify the formula. It disconnects into two independent clauses. I spawn independent searches on them. This ends up being this, this ends up being that, and I conjoin, all right? So I conjoin these guys. This is the other case similarly. If you unfold mutation, you, you basically get this guy. And now here's the punchline. The punchline is this is a decision D and an F. It is not a deterministic DNF. It is not a DNF. It's a very specific type of trace. 
The main use of these algorithms, whether explicitly for model counting or whether to compile into circuits that allow model counting, the inverse use is model counting. And their traces is this. What's the significance? The significance is, remember the exponential separation. You don't need this to count. You can count using this guy. And these guys are exponentially separated. But because you're splitting on variables, and, and I hope you see intuitively why splitting in variables got you into this guy, you are basically missing an exponential gap there because of this. All right, this would be one of the things. Now the question is, uh, you, you can see more about the story of traces and all of that later. Uh, let's look at it visually, visually. So you see what's going on here. What's going on is to do counting, I need determinism like this. If I have an or node, <clears throat> I need the, the alpha and beta to be mutually exclusive. They are here. And that's sufficient to do counting. But what I'm getting is this. I'm getting determinism in a specific way where I have X and something not X and that. So I'm getting these decision DNFs instead of these guys. And that is basically <clears throat> um, a suboptimality, big suboptimality. And it, you're bound to do this. We established this idea a while back and we showed that basically all of these model counters and knowledge compilers, they all have these traces and they're limited in this particular way. It's hard to break from this with this algorithm because it starts by saying, try X, try not X, committed decision. Now I'm gonna tell you about another problem that I'm interested in, which is even more for me at least at this point bothers me more than this one. We're gonna talk about how to break from this. Using these algorithms, how do I get something that is decomposable and not deterministic? I may not be interested in determinism. I don't want to count. I just want to do existential quantification. I'm interested in something like, let's say, functional synthesis or other things. I don't. I just want existential quantification. How do you do that? The minute you start and say, try X, try not X, determinism, you're solving a hundred problem. What do I do? How do I utilize these techniques <laughs> so that I do not commit myself to determinism first? Second, if I committed myself to determinism, not to decision determinism, but the more general part. Here's a dilemma, by the way, even though there's a whole bunch of uh, knowledge compilers and model counters out there, which effectively compile uh, deterministic DNFs, there is no DNNF compiler in existence as far as being, maybe somebody has somewhere built something that is being used commonly. And the reason is what I just told you. Everything we have, we build based on these techniques that commit to branching on variables get you in the world of determinism, get you in trouble. Okay, so, and the dilemma, if you wanna to try to do something, there was some ideas about doing something. It, the, the infrastructure that we've built on automated reasoning based on branching on variables is so sophisticated and so vast, it's really hard to do something like this. So the short story, and I, I hope I have about uh, five minutes or so, I'm gonna to have to run quickly through what's gonna come up next. The short story and main insight, which is I'm just gonna give you evidence theoretically and practically that's very promising. It's not a concluding story, not conclusive, uh, but hopefully to motivate people to work on this and to think about this like I'm doing now, is we're gonna do something interesting. We're gonna try to avoid the commitment that splitting on variables gets us into while still using the infrastructure that we've built based on branching on variables. How are we gonna do this? Remember the very first uh, slides? Technique from that we've seen in extended resolution, where I'm gonna use auxiliary variables to emulate the process of branching on formulas. Uh, so as we've seen in, in extended resolution, you can do this by adding an auxiliary variable and equating it to alpha. So now if I set X and not X, I'm branching on alpha. But you can do this more interesting or more generally. I don't have to have a mutually exclusive cases. You can do something like this also using the auxiliary variables. So if I have something like that, I can go and, and, and write these two by introducing this variable. Now, if you set uh, X to false, then you're making the case alpha. You set X to true, you're making better. So now I'm branching on alpha or beta, <coughs> which do not have to be mutually exclusive, again, using auxiliary variables. The question is, how do you operationalize this? Does this work? Now, Auxiliary variables are used commonly in SAT solving, but now it's not as the same because that's a very specific 
context. Uh, here is a little bit more general context. You can't just add auxiliary variables, as you'll see. So uh, the last set of results, I just have a few more slides, come from this paper we put on the archive a couple of years ago. Obud did this as a PhD student, and it was in his way out. So uh, I'm back to thinking about this now, um, and it's part of the reason I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the subject. The idea, to try to formalize this notion of adding auxiliary variables. So the idea is here's what you have to require something. Uh, if you have the original uh, function, this guy over x variables, I'm going to add these auxiliary variables y. And I'm going to require only one condition that if you existentially quantify the variables y from this guy, you get back that guy. Okay, now this sounds familiar for sad people because this is good enough for sad. Well, it's not good enough for our purpose as it turns out to be. And, and the reason if you, and, and, and there's a whole bunch of techniques that people have proposed for adding auxiliary variables, um, particularly in set context. And they, these are some of them, they all satisfy this property. The, the problem is because there is no polytime algorithm for existentially quantifying variables out of deterministic DNF, this is not good enough. So that means if you add these auxiliary variables to satisfy this property, and then this becomes very you know, easier, this will blow up if you use variable splitting, but if you do this, it works, that's not good enough because I cannot existentially quantify the variables to get that. So let's say you're doing sharp set. You cannot do sharp set on this guy. You have to existentially quantify and I can't do it. So that's not good. Now, if you wanna do the jump from decision DNF to deterministic, you need an additional condition and, and that can help you. I'm not gonna do this now. Uh, but I'm going to do the next jump from determinism to without determinism. And, and this is enough for that. All right. Because as you remember, I can existentially quantify variables and I, while affording to lose determinism. So let me wrap up here with this big picture. Here's the picture. Uh, the picture is you, you give me a Boolean formula. And I'm trying to compile it using the DPLL style, which commits to determinism. And therefore, it will be giving me a deterministic decomposable negation of a form. It's going to blow up. It doesn't work. <clears throat> uh, let's say because of succinctness that this Boolean formula doesn't have a representation in that uh, circuit type. So I'm going to go and do this EMF transformation and get you this uh, uh, function or formula with auxiliary variables. And now I'm going to compile it. And effectively, what I'm doing now is I'm long branching on, on formulas. And let's say I succeed in this case. And, and I'll show you theoretical and practical results that shows that's possible. It's not just a theoretical exercise. And then what I do is I know if I existentially quantify, I can't get what I want, right? Because that's not easy. But I can always get easily a DNNF. So the idea is. Take your Boolean formula, add auxiliary variables. Because you added them, now I can compile into deterministic decomposable. Existentially quantity variables get a DNNF. And now what I did is I showed you how you can build a DNNF compiler using deterministic DNNF compilers. What is the trick? The trick is to operate in a bigger space. So fine, I'll allow you to split on variables, but those would be in a, in a, in a larger space and therefore you're effectively branching on formulas. And, and just like to end by a couple of uh, pieces of evidence that make this very encouraging. As I thought, the picture is not complete. So this is uh, preliminary, but pretty exciting. The first result is, believe it or not, let's look at this picture. We know of Boolean formulas, families, where adding a single auxiliary variable, single, those, those formulas will blow up. They have no deterministic decomposable representation. Okay, for polysized. You add a single auxiliary variable, then they do. So this will fail by adding auxiliary variable. I know I, sh I should be able to get this and therefore I get that. And you see this in this paper, a single variable can allow you to uh, have an exponential uh, separation there. All right, and, and use this technique. We experimented a little bit with uh, the bounded variable addition uh, in this paper, and this is the technique introduced there. And uh, both theoretical and practical results. Uh, one of the results that I did mention is that CNF that have bounded primal tree with can be efficiently compiled into this form. Uh, the, 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 uh, the compilation algorithm time and space complexity is only exponential in between. So we showed that if you apply uh, BVA, 
uh, in a limited uh, way, then you bound the increase of degree width. In fact, we even found <clears throat> a class of formulas, family of formulas where by adding auxiliary variables, I can go from unbounded degree width to bounded degree width. So I guarantee you that there is no guarantee that you can compile these uh, for deterministic DNF, but by adding the auxiliary variables, I guarantee you they will be compiled efficiently, which is pretty interesting. And we had some preliminary experimental results showing this, again, very primitive, very limited, but it's evidence of promise. And this was based on the BVA, where we either ran, CTD is a, is a compiler I built uh, a while back uh, based on the techniques that were mentioned. It was actually probably the first uh, compiler for decision DNF uh, circuits. And this is running it on the plain input versus on an input with auxiliary variables and then forgetting. And you can see the interesting thing here is it's not like I'm getting twice as fast or something. It's I can do or I cannot do, which is, which is pretty uh, interesting. And just so that uh, people who know CTG compiler, CTG compiler, I wrote this a while back and it became obsolete. It's even only in 32 bits, uh, cannot even run on modern machines. So I was on sabbatical last quarter and guess what? I've been rewriting CTD and preparing a new version 364 bit should be coming out soon. Uh, and uh, with enough luck, we may, may include support for DNF compilation based on the ideas that I just uh, mentioned now. So I'm done folks, uh, in, in conclusion. This business of splitting or branching on variables versus formulas, it's been around, right? But I, I think it requires this more systematic treatment. It's so essential, it has to be a first class citizen in our thinking and in our analysis. And the, the notion of circuits and traces uh, gives us a very sharp lens to look at what's going on. And the bottom line is, you have two jumps going from uh, variables to sentences. And then within sentences, there are finer distinctions. I didn't say enough to make this very clear, the second claim, but I hope you got it behind. So it's not like one size fits all. There is all kinds of ways in which you can branch on sentences. And um, we just need to do more on this. And I think this is a critical thing to do these um, serious jumps in the efficiency of building knowledge compilers and underneath the search algorithms. And I think this notion of, of using auxiliary variables is very, very promising because it capitalizes on the vast infrastructure that uh, we've built over the years as far as um, SAT technology and what SAT technology gave us. So um, I wish to thank you. And uh, again, you can find more about all of this uh, from the YouTube channel of my group. Thank you. Thank you for the very nice talk. And uh, we'll open the floor to questions. Um, let me clap on behalf of everybody since we can't do that properly. Uh, but Thank we have you. about 10, 10 minutes for questions. So uh, encourage people to either speak up and ask a question or to drop questions into the chat windows. Um, and Let's see, we already have one here in the chat window from, uh, from uh, Stephen, I guess it's Stephen Gocht. Are there results on how clause learning relates to knowledge compilation, similar to how DPLL relates to OBDDs? Oh yes, in fact, um, the knowledge compilers, uh, the modern ones and uh, examples are uh, CTD and uh, D4. D4 is from Pierre Marquis, probably the latest as far as being very modern has the latest advantage. They do use closed learning. So I, I, I kept it DPLL and you know, DPLL is not exactly modern set solvers, right? However, uh, what I talked about actually applies for modern set solvers. Now, there is a paper with Umut Ostop that says, uh, which is the latest paper on doing this knowledge compilation while exploiting closed learning and you know all of the latest set technology of backtracking to the assertion level, da, da, da. that's all integrating these things. Um, it, it is in JER 2018, um, and, and it comes with proof of correctness. Cachet, uh, which is a model counter from a while back, did this initially. 
and uh, had some very interesting observations about subtleties when you integrate closed learning in these compilation algorithms. <clears throat> and we have a more recent one uh, with a detailed proof of correctness. So check that paper. It, it, it's an intricate story, frankly, uh, the interaction with closed learning and all of that. But uh, yes. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, let's see. I have a question also. Maybe other people can formulate their own questions in the meantime. But I was just wondering from the very beginning of your talk, I was struck that uh, branching on form formulas is sort of like doing cuts in proofs. So you think of a, if you have a se sequence calculus proof and you cut on a formula, that means you split into two, two sub proofs, one where you've assumed the formula is true and the other where you've assumed the formula is false. And so I'm wondering, you talked, as I understand it, just about expressibility with different classes of circuits. What about, or different classes of formulas? Have, has anyone looked into proof complexity based on restricting cuts to formulas in these classes? I don't know, this is not my area. In fact, I'm pleased to hear this. And in fact, if later you can send me a link, I would like to see those because I'm looking for insights. And uh, so I don't know the short story, uh, but um, I, I, I wanna hear more uh, okay. about it because uh, that may, you see one of the issues is how do you do this, right? So I, I gave you, uh, promising evidence, but we don't yet have a systematic way of doing it that really works broadly. And it's all about the choices of what, I mean, sure, you can mechanize it using uh, additional variables, but what do you do? Uh, what do you equate X to? Uh, we, we don't have a theory, we don't have a, you know, we have some <laughs> ideas and the, the more the better. So there may be some insights from what you're talking about that can guide us a little bit into how do we make these choices practically. Right. Yeah. So to make those question precise, suppose you allow in the sequence calculus cuts on the on I guess D N N F formulas. I guess that was your weakest class. And does that allow formulas to be? Does that allow proofs to become super poly polynomially shorter? For instance, when dealing working in prop in propositional logic it would be a good question. As far as I know, no one's looked at this kind of thing at all. So, um, okay. But there Very are good. analogs of this inside inside bound arithmetic. May I add an insight into this, guys? Um, I think from a pragmatic point of view, you can look at the structure of these things that you're trying to compile. They have a lot of structure. The formulas are uh, part of that specification. And so you can, you don't have to actually uh, divine, you know, uh, what formulas to split on and so on and so forth. Just take the structure that somebody has written into their spec and see if you can actually take advantage of that. My experience is that that always, you know, that insight that went into putting that spec is gonna help in figuring out how to actually analyze it. Right. I agree. And in fact, uh, this set of uh, simple results on B of A and three width is along these lines, Karen. Uh, so uh, I can add variables to reduce three width, for example, right? And for to do that, I need the structure of the input formula and I'm now thinking at another level, like you're suggesting. Right. Yes, yes, indeed. Okay. Um, there's a comment in the chat window for the people who want to follow up on the talk. There's a link to the paper of Ot 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 Otsak and, and Adnan on there. Okay. Uh, any other questions or comments, either from panelists or attendees? They gave me a hard time a month ago. Now they're being kind. So. Oh, maybe you answered too many questions back then. <laughs> All right. Well, and, and, yeah, sorry, ahead, yes, ahead. yes, thank you. No, I'm done. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you for a very nice talk. Oh, wait, we have a question. Back up. So Sue Pratik asks, um, is it possible to decide whether a given formula has a succinct D DNF? Deterministic, is it possible to decide? Uh, well, we do have a, a three-width guarantee, uh, but of course that's not complete. So if, if, a, if a, the primal three-width and not just primal three-width, you, you know how it is with, with these uh, uh, graph theoretic parameters, there's different ways to abstract the formulas, the primal graph, incidence graph, this and that, and there's different kind of parameters. So there's a whole set of uh, these fixed parameter guarantees that actually guarantee you uh, efficient compilation. Uh, the simplest one is three-width of the primal graph, but uh, which is nice, 
Uh, but of course, in general, uh, and, and of course, we know a whole thing, number of things where this will blow up. Uh, but I don't know, full characterization is probably really difficult to have. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Thank you very much again. We'll take a three minute break. Oh. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, we'll Fantastic. take a th th three minute break and uh, start promptly at the half hour. For most right, of us, great. very good. Whatever, whatever time zone you're in, it's probably on your half hour. Uh, 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 and I'm sorry, I have to leave the session because I have to go teach next. So, uh, so. all right, thanks. Even well, these days of COVID-19, YouTube. we have to teach on, yeah, real time sometimes. <laughs> right. All right. Very good. All right. Thank okay. you guys. All right. More. Okay. Thank you. Okay.